Hello, I'm Doug Clo. I'm from the Institute of Educational Technology here at the Open University in the UK and this is a workshop on creating an action plan for learning analytics that's part of LASI 2015, uh, the Learning Analytics Summer Institute 2015 brought to you by the Society for Learning Analytics Research or SOLA and uh, it's also supported by the LACE project, Learning Analytics Community Exchange, which is a project I'll tell you a little bit more about later. Now, the idea of this is it is a workshop. It may be a, a video online, but the idea is that you actually do things that, and there are several places in the video where I'll tell you to pause and write down and work on uh, your current situation to help you create an action plan for learning analytics. You could just play the video through and not pause when I uh, ask you to, but it will be best if you actually do something and actually engage with it. And it will work even better if you have someone else you can talk to about that, because when I did this as a real live workshop uh, at the BET show in 2015, I did get people to work in pairs and to talk to each other, and it does work that well that way, but it'll also work if you do it on your own. So I'm going to assume about you, I've got to make a few assumptions about you. I'm assuming that uh, you know a little bit about learning analytics, but not a lot, and you want to know a little bit more and start working on a journey to implement it. I'm going to assume that you're working somewhere, perhaps a little bit like a university or a university or somewhere in an educational context where you can do something that uh, will affect uh, the learners. And uh, what I want to do with the whole thing is to take you on a journey. This is going to be an overextended metaphor, but we'll see how far we can go with it. You see what I did there? Uh, it's a long way. It's not certain about where we're going. Uh, the train's not yet mapped. Learning analytics is still a young field. Uh, and we, we are pioneers uh, here. Me and you, we can work together. It's hard work. It's difficult working with new stuff. There's a lot of frustrations along the way, but it can be a great journey and the view gets better as you go along. There's more and more data and you find out more and more about your learners. And this talk is licensed under a Creative Commons by license, so you're free to do what you like with it, copy it, share it, adapt it, remix it, send it off to someone else. Uh, but I would like you to please uh, just attribute the work to me as the author and uh, the LACE project. But uh, please do reuse it and pass it on. So all those preliminaries done, let's get going on our journey and uh, working that journey metaphor. The first point is to think about where do you want to get to? What's your destination you have in mind? The next step is to think about where you are now, so uh, looking and analysing at your current situation, and then look at what are the next steps that might get you from where you are now to where you want to get to in learning analytics. So to start off with, to talk about where do you want to get to, you might not have a great idea about that if you don't know a lot about learning analytics. So I'm going to start with a little gentle introduction to what we mean by learning analytics, which if you've heard, if you've heard some of my talks before, it might be familiar to you. But if you haven't, then uh, here's your uh, first go. I'm going to start off with a definition of learning analytics. Uh, the reason for having a cat here is because analytics is very much an internet-y sort of thing, and the internet has cats, so we've got a cat here. This definition came from uh, the first international conference on learning analytics and knowledge, uh, LAC 2011, although it actually came out of a, a MOOC that ran before that uh, conference. And the definition, it's one of these terse, dense academic definitions, is that learning analytics is the measurement, collection, analysis and reporting of data about learners and their contexts for the purposes of understanding and optimising learning and the environments in which it occurs. And uh, there's a lot of very closely related fields to learning analytics, data mining, business intelligence, academic analytics, learner, learner analytics, if you make a distinction between that and learning analytics. The focus here for me, uh, for learning analytics, is that you're concerned with the learner uh, and on the learning. It's not so much the management and administration of learning, you're actually caring about people learning new things and finding out new stuff. There's another definition that I, I like uh, from Eric Duval at uh, KU Leuven in Belgium, which is about collecting the traces that learners leave behind and using those traces to improve learning. And as more and more learning happens online or in electronic contexts, we get more and more traces from learners about what they're doing and we have more and more opportunities for using those traces to improve learning. And then there's a model uh, here that I like to think of about what makes for effective use of uh, learning analytics, which is a learning analytics cycle. It's based on uh, a lot of cycles that one gets in uh, educational theory, action, uh, reflection cycles, those sorts of things. The idea is we start uh, with the learners. We're good teachers. We always want to start with the learners. The learners do things that generate data. 
that data we distill down into some sort of metric. So they generate vast volumes of data, more and more as uh, time goes by. We, you, we distill that down to get some sort of metrics, uh, some way of measuring that data, getting a, a view on that data that makes sense to us. Then we use that, those metrics to inform interventions. We do something that makes a difference to the learners, that brings it right back to the start. And for me, the point about uh, learning analytics isn't just to have learners generate data and uh, get metrics out of the end of it. That's, that's a great endeavour. That's uh, quantitative educational research and a, uh, a fine tradition of it. I've done some of it myself. But f for me, the point of learning analytics is to close that feedback loop and do something that gets it back to learners. And it needn't be a big thing or a small thing, or it could be something in between. As a very small example, it might be a learner does something to an interactive online environment that generates data that the online environment uses to generate a little metric to say something about what they're doing. That then triggers an intervention to the learner themselves who then does something different in the next step. And that's a very tight, close feedback loop that happens very quickly and it affects just one learner at a time that way. At the opposite end of the scale, you might think of uh, a minister of education or something like that who looks at data from learners in the entire university system of their country, distills that down into some metrics that uh, measures something or captures something about those learners, and then designs some intervention, some change they make to the entire system that affects the learners everywhere in their country, which again, and this is uh, the point about it being cycling, a cycle, that generates some data which you can then look to compare to see whether the intervention you made makes a difference. So that's uh, a lot of uh, um, definitions and uh, high thinking and it's, uh, it can be quite hard to think in the abstract if you haven't got anything concrete. So I'll talk uh, a little bit about some examples. And the first set of examples is dashboards. Uh, if you put university dashboard into Google image search or anything you like dashboard, you will get lots and lots of uh, uh, images and uh, products. Every product, every university, every school has some dashboard or analytics. Every vendor has some analytic of um, every vendor of analytics. Uh, I said every vendor of analytics software is also educational. That's more of an overstatement than I meant. Uh, every vendor of educational software has an analytics dashboard, but it is nearly that uh, intense. And the point about a dashboard is it can give you an illusion of control and mastery. You can see these uh, these readouts here and feel like you know what's going on and uh, are on top of it, but that need not necessarily be true. I think uh, I'd encourage us to look more at using these things to make data visible to people who can and will do something about it. So it's not just a technical system, it's a human system involving people. And if we think about the dashboard analogy, and we're still in there with the, the journey metaphor, uh, if you've got a dashboard, it's very important that you don't just look at your dashboard all the time. Because if you look at the dashboard all the time, you'll crash. You have to look out at what's going on. You have to navigate. You have to think about where you're going and use your dashboard as an aid, not the only thing uh, that you're using to understand and comprehend what you're doing. So there are dashboards that can capture information about what your students are doing at any one time, how their grades are, uh, what they've done before, what their demographics are, that sort of thing. You can use that data to do something else with it. And that's my next example. And this, uh, the Signals project at uh, Purdue University was the first uh, big uh, learning analytics project. And if you talk about what you mean by learning analytics, it's often stuff like Signals at Purdue. And uh, Signals is, uh, I think, still the only learning analytics project that has uh, published data about its performance and how well it does. And even that has some queries over it. There are lots of products like this. Almost every uh, LMS or VLE vendor has a product uh, a lot like this. And so your VLA may well already have something like this and you just need to switch it on if you find out from someone who knows uh, how to do that. What it does, what does it actually do? It takes all the information that it's, the system has about the student, which can be all the demographic information you've got about the student before they start, what courses they've enrolled in, and then as, uh, as they make progress through their uh, studies, it's got information about what grades they're getting, about attendance, about their activity in uh, online forums, even if you want to plug it in library data and things like that. <clears throat> And it uses, uh, it does some sophisticated uh, predictive modelling to place students into one of three risk groups. And that's where the traffic light idea comes in. We're still on a journey, see? Uh, and that 
puts them as a green traffic light, an amber traffic light, or a red traffic light, and that's used as a trigger for interventions from the tutors, uh, from the student's tutor. And they've seen uh, in their uh, paper in the LAC conference uh, consistent uh, retention and grade improvements, not just on the pass-fail boundary, I think, interestingly, but also at the AB boundary. So good students are doing even better, which I think is uh, really exciting. Now, something I said there needs a little bit un of unpacking. I said the predictive model was used as a trigger for intervention emails to the student or something like that. And this can mean that the student's experience of this can be very, very different. And I've got a couple of examples. Here's the, the negative example. We've got it from a do not reply email address uh, it's saying you're in trouble. The predictive model says that you've got this very, very precise chance of failing this course and you must see a teacher immediately. It sounds like you're in trouble. You've done something wrong. Uh, when I first put this slide together, <coughs> I thought this was about as bad as it could be, but I've since seen examples, and I'm not going to uh, name the institution where uh, I've seen these, where there are emails like this that are worse than this because not only is it a bit like this, but it's long and wordy and complex, and it's not even clear what it's telling you. At least this, it's clear what the problem is, and, uh, and there's a call to action telling you what you can do about it. So there are ways you could get even worse than this. But if you have something that's more like this, saying, hi, Alex, it's calling the student by name, it's saying oh, it's a concern for their welfare. I noticed you haven't logged on this week. That, them not having logged on this week, <clears throat> is probably what drove the uh, the trigger of the intervention email in the first place and that they struggled with the last assessment. But here that's clear in the email is what has prompted this email. And then there's a, a commitment to working jointly together to work through and the call to action to do something that's human and can help bring them forward. So how you implement uh, a predictive model with your students and tutors is critically important to how the students will perceive it. And I believe, though I don't yet have the data to prove, that that will make a bigger difference to uh, retention and progression than if you just send out those rather nasty uh, emails like that up at the top there. So the next example is course choice models. And these are similar to predictive models. Well, they are predictive models, but what they do is uh, they uh, help students with their, their study choice. As the inputs to these models, they take the degree requirements, what courses you have to do to get a particular degree. It takes your record to date as a student and also how you uh, and also what other students who went on to succeed did and uh, how that worked for them and it uses that algorithm to generate personalized study choice recommendations so it can say okay given that you want to do this degree and you've done this well in these subjects you're probably well advised to do this path next rather than that path perhaps because say uh, you uh, did very well on the maths uh, courses in your uh, initial route through study that suggests perhaps going for the maths uh, the high maths track for later in the degree will be a good idea, but if you did not so well on the maths you want, perhaps you better go for the, the less maths you want. So this is again built on uh, student data that can help support student choice and how that's implemented uh, will make a big difference. The next example is a little is a much smaller thing. It's called uh, SNAP, Social Networks Adapting Pedagogic Practice, that came originally out of the University of Wollongong in Australia. And this gives you network visualizations of forum activity data from your VLE or uh, LMS. It helps you see patterns. This is it. It looks at the forum data, at just ordinary forums, and it plugs into uh, uh, almost any VLE or LMS that you already have. Uh, it, it's a plug-in for the browser, so it doesn't need you to do anything on the uh, the server side. So you can do it as an individual teacher, which I, makes me like it a lot more. And it helps you identify people who are at risk or might be at risk and improve your teaching. It gives you another way of looking at the data that's already there for you. And if I zoom in a little bit, you can see a bit, uh, this gives you a, a different view on it. Those students who are there in the middle, they're clearly densely connected, they're central to the network, they're doing things. Then there's that cloud of students around the outside, and you can see that they've got much fewer uh, connections. Just to be clear, those little red dots, each of those is a student, and each black line is that student posting a reply to another student. So where you can see it, there's a red blob with one line from it, that's uh, the student has uh, posted one reply to something by this other red blob, which is the other student. And what you can see is uh, up in the uh, top there, you can see there's uh, a number of students who are completely disconnected from the network who haven't contributed. And you can click through and see what's going on there, which might be for a good reason or it might be for a bad reason. 
and that it's just giving you more tools to help you understand what you've already got. So that was a few examples. Uh, what else could you do? There's an awful lot that you can do, starting with what data do we have about our learners. We've got the demographic uh, data, we've got the previous educational experience, we've got their grades, scores, achievements and their struggles, what they've uh, found difficult. We can get much more fine-grained information about what they're doing and where they are. We can log attendance, you can log it with smart cards or uh, even just with their phone. We can find their location. You can do really quite sophisticated location stuff right down to the meter level uh, to see where they are. You can even do some uh, stuff with where the students are looking. If you've got two uh, video cameras, you can triangulate that to see which of your students are watching the, uh, the lecturer as the lecturer moves around in the room. Just because we can do it doesn't mean we should do it, and this is an ethical question, then I'll come back to it. Software logs, everything that a student does can in theory be logged. Uh, everything they do online, we could track that, and everything they do online on our systems we can track. We can also do something to start tracking them across the web, and this is a thing that uh, you can do with tracking cookies that have been controversial for uh, privacy reasons, and we can build, we're getting more and more ability to generate this sort of data every week. There's uh, a new uh, announcement of things that you can uh, pick up and uh, and capture as raw data. So what can you do with that uh, data that might help learning? Well, we can identify learners who need help. That can be something really simple. It could just be, here's a list of the learners who haven't visited the VLE this week. Um, or it could be something more complex, some predictive model like I was talking about before. You can use that data to trigger interventions that could be via their teacher or it could be something that's direct the system itself generates an email also critically and this is a thing I would really like us to do as a community we can use that data to see which interventions work when we do something it's back to this that cycle I had at the beginning when we've done something if we compare the data from before to the data after to see if that made an improvement or even better we try with some students but not with us and see whether the students who had it did better we, we generate, we're gathering this data for doing learning analytics. I think it's incumbent on us to use that data to understand whether what we're doing makes an, a difference. Yeah, we've been talking at quite a, a large coarse grained level. You can get very detailed and build a complete cognitive learning system or an intelligent tutor or something like that. Uh, at a level up from that, it could just be suggesting resources or sources of help. So this would be a, a system that would say, learners like you found this helpful, uh, or this person might be able to help you, whether that's a tutor or another student. So there's a whole range of possibilities for what we can do. And uh, the next step, this is where the, uh, the uh, interactive bit comes. What I want you to do is write down what's the one thing you most want to do at your institution. This is about thinking about where you want to get to and in a moment I will ask you to pause the video and uh, actually write this down. It could be something really big, it could be something really small, so it could be some really big procurement exercise, you want an analytics infrastructure, you want a data warehouse, a, a data viz analytics suite uh, and that sort of thing. Or it might be something really small, you want to run a small exercise in a couple of your lectures with your students. You might be wanting to develop an entire analytics strategy for your uh, institution. Or it could just be you want to get the students their marks a lot quicker next time they uh, have a marking round. So what I want you to do is think about what I've said uh, already. What's the one thing you most want to do at your institution? And that's our vision for where you want to go or the uh, part of that. So now's the point where you pause the video Pause the video, write down and answer the question. I'm going to assume that you have paused the video uh, and uh, carry on. So the next step is to look at where are you now uh, to analyse a bit about your current context to help you in your journey to where you want to go. Because if you don't know where you are, you don't know how to go to where you might want to get to. And to help with this, there's a learning analytics framework uh, by uh, Wolfgang Gala and uh, Hendrik Draxler, uh, that looks at the different components and uh, influences, factors affecting learning analytics. And we have the stakeholders, uh, the people who, are, uh, who care about this. I'll unpack some of these as we go along. We have the stakeholders, uh, the people who care about it. We have internal limitations. I'll come on to that again as well. We have external constraints. Uh, we have the instruments, this is the technology, the algorithm, the theories behind uh, what you're doing, and I've talked a little bit about that as we were going along already. 
There's uh, the data. What sort of data are you going to be gathering? Again, I talked about the sort of data you might uh, have already, and I might come back to data later. And uh, the objectives. What is it you want to do with this? Is it just reflective? Is it showing what's going on, something fairly descriptive, or is it something predictive that's uh, looking ahead and using that to improve the system? So this is a way of thinking about all these. I'll come and look at these uh, one at a time. We'll start with stakeholders. And there are a lot of stakeholders in learning analytics projects. The institution's going to care about uh, what you're doing uh, about learning analytics. So that's right up to senior management, deans, heads of department, people who are uh, uh, closer line managers. The teachers, what's going on? If you're not a teacher yourself, please include the teachers in what you're doing because they're the ones who understand the learning context. And the only ones who understand the learning context even more than the teachers is the learners. Uh, and the learners are key stakeholders in all this. And I strongly urge you to involve them and engage them in uh, what you're doing. All of these people will be coming with their own agendas and their own ideas about what you should be doing and what the problems are uh, and your learning analytics project is going to need to take account of all those. And it's not just these people who are directly involved, there are other people who are directly involved. There's your IT team, uh, whoever is responsible for your uh, technical infrastructure. You may have a learning and teaching centre, a bunch of people who help academics with their uh, getting uh, with learning and teaching uh, with uh, getting stuff online dealing with educational technology that sort of people there's your registry or whoever it is uh, who deals with managing the information about students registering them uh, doing the formal administration there's the library who uh, gather a lot of information and also has a, a great source of expertise about uh, data and managing data and managing metadata and also maybe your estates department they're going to care about what you're doing in physical space and if you're doing something about uh, capturing data actually is uh, your uh, the people responsible for your physical uh, environment may have something really useful to add to that. So having thought about uh, the stakeholders who uh, might uh, influence your project, we'll think a little bit about the internal limitations. To make this work, you're going to need a whole range of competencies, uh, people who can specify what you need to do, what uh, needs to happen, people who can make that happen, deploy it, uh, people who maintain it once it's out there, people who can interpret the data, people who can make sense about of uh, what's there, and people who can do something about it. It's this action bit. And also it needs to be accepted by people, taken on board by uh, all of those internal stakeholders, and you need the resources to make it all happen. And I can't stress too much how much you need to think about a social system as well as a technical system. The technical system has to work. That's necessary, but it's not sufficient. It needs to be a social system that draws in people. This skill, in emerging skill of interpreting data and making good action on that data is something that's hard to build, but you need to build it up. And almost certainly you'll want a multi-skilled team to uh, cover all of this uh, stuff or be a polymath yourself. The next uh, set of uh, influences are external constraints. These are things external to, the, uh, to your project. There are things you ought to do and things you must do. Uh, the, the law says uh, you must do. There's the conventions, the ethics, and this is really important in learning analytics. The data that we're capturing, you might have uh, got a bit of a sense of that when I was talking through the sort of data that we can capture about students. I didn't even go on to talk about the problems that might occur when you start making inferences from that data. If you can, from a simple inference on that data, work out that there's only a 1% chance of success that a particular student is going to pass the course, what are you going to do with that data? Sticking your head in the sand isn't a, a good answer to that. The right answer to that will depend on your institution's mission and it's really difficult. And it, all of this raises real serious questions of privacy, accessibility, equality and diversity. Tragically, when you start looking at some of the demographic drivers of uh, performance in higher education and in other educational contexts, all of those uh, issues about uh, marginalised groups crop up big time. And what you do about that uh, is massively important. And again, you can't stick your hand in your sand and these things aren't a problem. They are a problem. Knowing exactly how they're a problem and in what ways, I would say, is the beginning of being able to do something about it. Transparency is hugely important. Sharing with your stakeholders what you're doing, why you're doing it, what the potential benefits are is really important. And accountability, being answerable for what you're doing. There's also, uh, as well as those things that you should be doing, uh, there's the things that you must be doing that the law says you must do, whether it's uh, uh, 
local, national or uh, international legislation or policy frameworks uh, in your context. There's a lot of stuff that's relevant in data protection legislation, particularly here in Europe. Uh, freedom of information uh, uh, policies and uh, legislation and also policies about and uh, legislation about equality and diversity. And all of these need to influence what you do. Now, I said a little bit that I'd come back to thinking about data and uh, what I want to do here is to think about what do we mean by learning? And this is, uh, this, uh, uh, indulge me a little as an academic one, I want to try and unpick this. There are lots of different conceptions of learning, one of which might be that you're just transmitting information from one head to another or from a book or a uh, website into someone's head. But there are more richer conceptions of learning that are about change capacity to act. And when we're thinking about the data we've got about our students, if we think about that data, does your university or learning context actually learn about its students? If we think about our, our students and uh, them learning, students who download the PowerPoint of your lecture or uh, uh, save a video uh, from someone on uh, YouTube, if they just download it and save it, it's very easy for them or me to think that you, oh, I've got that information, I, I've got that in some way. In a sort of sense, I have, but I haven't understood it. It's just downloaded. Uh, Books are great. Uh, we've got a lovely uh, picture of uh, Trinity College Library here. Um, data is, is great. I like data even more than I like books. Um, and even PowerPoint can be great, but it's no use unless someone understands it and does something about it. So this is where I'm, I'm getting with uh, student data. The data you're capturing about students, storing that data about the students is only the beginning of the process. You need to understand that data and use that understanding to do something differently, to make a difference, to make a change. And that's where the value comes. And that's where you're learning as an institution about your students and thus being able to uh, do even better. So to come back to our framework for thinking about uh, learning analytics uh, and about where you are now, uh, to rattle through it again, we've got our stakeholders, a whole range of stakeholders. We've got the internal limitations, the uh, things uh, internal to your uh, institution. We've got the external constraints, the things you ought to do, the things you must do. There's the instruments, what are you going to do technically. There's the data you're ca uh, going to capture uh, of various sorts. And what are you going to do about it? What's your objective in doing all this? And what I want you to do is think about all of those things and think about what's the biggest challenge at your institution for where you are now? What's the biggest challenge to achieving what you set out to achieve in the first uh, session? And the first question. So again, I want you to pause the video, write down what's the biggest challenge at your institution? Did you pause there? Good. OK. Now, once uh, you've had a uh, think about uh, what's the biggest challenge at your institution, I'm going to do a talk to you very quickly about uh, what happened at a couple of other institutions. First one is my own uh, institution, the Open University. Uh, we had uh, big challenges, uh, but we've uh, made a, a big response. A bit early to tell whether it's uh, been uh, successful or not, but we have had, certainly had uh, a big response. Um, we have uh, over two, we have about 200,000 students, although we have Fewer than that now, and actually that's our uh, part of our challenge is that uh, our student numbers are sinking. We've had a, a real issue with the new funding regime here in uh, the UK. So part of our response to that is a really big, uh, there's a, about 50 projects or so uh, under each of these seven headings, trying to use analytics more systematically and to benefit our students. So we've uh, looked at intervention evaluation. This is trying to track when we do something to see whether that makes a difference and to get better at capturing what we're doing and uh, evaluating it. We've got a strand looking at data visualizations of our existing data. Uh, we've uh, gone through a procurement exercise and uh, bought uh, SAS VA as uh, a tool to help us with that, but rolling that out as an issue, which uh, I'll come on to in a moment. There's the ethics framework. I've raised ethical issues uh, several times through this talk. They're really big. They're really important. And for us as the Open University, we uh, would like to think that we really care about uh, what we're doing and we're uh, the whole our whole rationale uh, is an eth uh, for existing as an institution is an eth deeply ethical one. And I think we are the first university in the world to have an explicit learning analytics ethics policy that's there on our website. You can go and look at it now. 
and it was developed in consultation with students, only some of our students, but with real life students. And I think that's really important. And it was on the critical path for doing some of this stuff. We're doing a lot of work on predictive modeling, the sort of stuff I've been talking about. Uh, we've got a strand of work on uh, getting better data about uh, the learning experience so that we can uh, do better with that. And then a key one, enabling one across all of this is professional development, upskilling everybody. So it's not just that we've got SAS VA and it sits in a cupboard where one or two analysts produce visualizations that they send to everybody. The, the long term vision for what we want to do here is to increase our capacity as a, an institution to be able to understand the data we've got and act on it in a decentralized way so that it doesn't all have to come through the central work. I could talk uh, at length about this, uh, but that's not the theme of this talk. There's another uh, large institution that has its own uh, challenges, Manchester Metropolitan University, and uh, Mark Stubbs has been doing some uh, quite uh, large-scale work here and produced what I think is one of the most amazing uh, slides about learning analytics I've ever seen uh, based on the tube map uh, that's full of interesting uh, ideas uh, about uh, where things can go. And if you look at the curriculum hierarchy, which is the, uh, the grey line that runs from uh, up uh, in the top right, goes from up there and it goes down and down there, uh, faculty department, uh, down to uh, programme courses, units, mandatory sessions, questions, resource assignments, all the way through there. And then if you look at the uh, key at the bottom, it says curriculum hierarchies terminating at course at the moment. Uh, so there's a lot uh, going on at Manchester Metropolitan and uh, I urge you to uh, talk to Mark Stubbs if you get the chance, he's a great guy. So. What are the next steps? So we've thought a little bit about where you are now and what other institutions are doing. Uh, the next thing is to think about what the next steps are. I'm an academic. If someone asks me for help, I like to say, oh, here's a whole load of things you can read. And uh, this project, uh, this uh, session is sponsored by the LACE project, the Learning Analytics Community Exchange. This is a, a Framework 7 project. It's a coordination and support action for those of you who speak Euro jargon. What we're trying to do is to coordinate and support learning analytics uh, practitioners and researchers across Europe. Uh, we're building an evidence hub. Uh, we're running a whole series of events. We're going to lots of other people's events. That's why we're here as part of uh, LASI 2015. And we have a whole series of publications, briefings, webinars, that sort of thing. We've got uh, a blog. Here's a, a load of uh, URLs to help point you at uh, different parts of the uh, project. We have a blog. We have a newsletter you can sign up. We send that out quarterly. We're developing some uh, frequently asked questions. We have a learning analytics review that are more serious heavyweight things, a little bit short from uh, short of a full uh, academic paper that are more uh, actionable. And we have a network, a growing network of associate partners who work with us on developing these things doing activities and uh, building the field together. So please get in touch, join us as an associate partner. The main URL's there at the top of the uh, site, uh, top of the page, and you can uh, come and join us. Uh, JISC in the UK has been doing a lot of work on uh, learning analytics, analysing the current state of play in uh, UK higher and further education. They've just launched a code of practice for learning analytics. That's as of uh, June 2015. And there's more uh, coming on. They've had a series of network meetings. There's uh, their URL there. They're doing some really good stuff and are worth keeping in touch with. And of course, there's the Society for Learning Analytics Research, who run all sorts of good things, including uh, LASI workshops. There's the LAC conferences, the Solar Flare local meetings. And there's going to be a, a, a Solar Flare here in, in uh, the UK in October. Uh, look out for it. There's uh, the Solar Storm PhD training, doctoral training things. There's the Journal of Learning Analytics and much, much more. So those are places you can go to find out more. So what's the next the next step, the one specific concrete thing you will do next? Just saying, specify uh, the procurement process for your large scale learning analytics system is a little bit large scale. This needs to be an abstract and this needs to be something that's specific and concrete that you'll be doing next. It could be a tiny thing to see what analytics your uh, learning environment can produce already, uh, spending half an hour doing that. Or it could be something big like uh, developing an internal funding pitch for a comprehensive uh, analytics plan. So make it concrete and specific and make the first step on it something you can do today as soon as you finish watching this video or maybe first thing tomorrow or Monday or whenever it is, but something that's specific and concrete and you can move forward. So time to stop again and write down. Okay, I'll assume you have stopped here and paused uh, and uh, written down your next uh, step. I've got some uh, motivational uh, ideas to, to finish off with. 
getting academics to do things is really hard. There was a, uh, I, this uh, made a really big impression on me. Lewis Elton stood up one time and uh, about trying to, in a slightly different context, he said, organising academics is like herding cats, but they will come if you leave a saucer of cream. So do you think about the incentives that you're making available for your, uh, uh, your academics, your uh, teachers, your lecturers? And uh, if they can see what the benefits are for them and for the things that they're passionate about, which is uh, very often uh, uh, teaching their students or spending less effort, then they will come to you rather than if you try to uh, make them do what you tell them. And I speak as an academic myself. The other uh, one is uh, a motivation one that it can seem like you have this massive mountain to climb to get to where you need to get to. And it certainly feels like that for me uh, on uh, some days. But uh, there's the Lao Tzu uh, uh, idea that uh, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step to start climbing the mountain. You need to uh, start climbing it. And there, there was uh, that amazing thing uh, uh, a while ago where uh, those climbers climbed the dawn wall of El Capitan without uh, uh, support of ropes. And it only took them 19 days to climb this massively impossible uh, uh, granite-faced mountain. But it wasn't just those 19 days of doing things, it was also decades of training and preparation, which shows you what you can do if you start building and preparing and building on what you can do and improving your capacity. And uh, my final exhortation is to test what you do. See if it'll work. Uh, you'll have data about it. So capture the data before and after at minimum. Ideally, run a little experiment see with, uh, in a small group, see whether it does make a difference. Because we in of all uh, practitioners, if, we've, if we're gathering data, you can do something about it. And that can help us move towards uh, evidence-based practice as a field. So finally, I'd like to thank everybody uh, who's uh, helped support all the stuff I've been talking about. The LACE project here at the Open University, long list of uh, colleagues who've been very helpful. The LACE project partners uh, who've helped and supported us. The learning analytics community, including Solar uh, and uh, the uh, International Educational Data Mining Society and everybody who's uh, met and talked to me at LAC and LAS in other events that have happened. And also always very grateful to the European Commission for uh, funding the LACE project. So that's the end of uh, my talk. I hope that's been useful. Uh, you can go back and uh, revisit it uh, and do go on, visit the LACE project. We've got more resources that can help you. Thank you very much.